Hey folks, huge shout out to Caden Gardner for this awesome story. Make sure to go check out his teaser video for a dubbed version of the Cadenverse webtoon, aka the Out of Darkness universe. Link will be in the description below. What is the difference between purpose and destiny? I was created for a purpose. I was to be my father's vengeance across the cosmos against those he claimed so seriously wronged him. My purpose was to be his chosen heir, but my destiny put me somewhere completely different. Father Time tells me that destiny is fluid. It's forever changing, like a river flowing. It can bend, it can curve, it can do the unexpected. It can also be damned shut. It can fork, or it can reach its destiny, flow out into the ocean. Destiny is complicated. I find myself thinking about my brother Dagon sometimes. He had taken me and used my brain to try and speak with my father. It worked. There are times I can still feel him wriggling around in there. I still get visions of what he wanted to do. To silence humanity. To kill everything. Trent Grayson nearly gave his life to kill him during the Battle of Tokyo. This story takes place 14 months later. During that time, Trent and Ophelia had a kid. He was a cute little baby. They argued about the name for a bit, eventually settling on the name Derek Grayson. I bring this up because I was watching Ophelia rock the baby back and forth while Trent explained our assignment to my mother, myself, and my sister Angelica. I don't like it any more than you, but if I'm being honest, this is way safer than fighting Dagon or Lilith, he said. My mother wasn't faced at all by this. She only read over the documents Trent had provided. I suppose it could be worse. However, I'm not a fan of using my children as spies, even with Grace assisting. If you don't want us to do it, we won't. I'm not going to force a parent to risk their child, Trent said as he glanced over at his wife and Derek. Michael gave me the briefing about the guilt. My mother said, If they're in the school, a lot of parents' children are in danger, and they don't even know it. Plus, mine are more equipped to handle that sort of thing. Trent eyed me. How do you feel about this whole thing? He asked. It's just attending school and keeping my ear to the ground. Doesn't seem too hard. I said. How do you feel about it? My mother asked. I leaned back in the wooden kitchen chair and crossed my arms. The smell of the rotisserie chicken on the table was strong. I was hungry. My stomach growled. It was hard to think. I wanted to help. I did. But then again, I hadn't attended school in over a year. I'd continued my education, yes. Mainly at my mother's insistence. Something about being the son of the literal devil and being right in the middle of a cosmic war with hell made school seem not so important to me. But it was to my mom, so I made an effort. Now, our assignment was to go back, attend class, and make friends. Several kids at the school had parents whose names were on the list of cultists that had been part of the Apollyon Guild. The ISDD had been looking into the Apollyon Guild for months at this point. The list they had identified 57 US politicians and prominent business owners and CEOs. Several of these people sent their children to a boarding school in upstate New York called Hamilton Academy. Angelica and I would be sent to this school posing as the niece and nephew of an anonymous rich family. The Secretary of Defense, Rear Admiral Valentine had gotten us and Agent Greystone in sight. We were to start in the new semester. Grace would be posing as Valentine's niece. Trent and Ophelia would stay in a nearby hotel and do surveillance on the school administration, particularly the dean, a woman called Glenda Holloway, a woman who just happened to be on the list as well. We had the rest of the ISDD team around. Their jobs were to assist with surveillance as well as to keep any of Gideon's bounty hunters from collecting on any of us. We knew Gideon was a problem. But we weren't 100% sure if they had a presence at the school. Trent thought so. If the cult worshipped Abaddon, then Gideon was undoubtedly somehow involved. The only problem was that they knew our faces, so we had to keep our heads down. 
I also had to shave my hair. Grace colored hers blonde, Angelica colored hers black. It did wonders for our appearances. We arrived at the school for orientation. It was a boarding school, so we would be staying in dorms. Angelica and Grace got to be roommates. Lucky them. I was introduced to the supervisor of my dorm. He was a broad man who looked as if he was former military. He called himself Richards. He looked tired when he shook my hand. You're Dante Grayson? He asked. That was my alias for this operation, as my real name was currently attached to a $14 million bounty. I nodded as he motioned for me to follow him. Welcome to Hamilton Academy. A few ground rules for the dorms. The dorm was a big four-story building. It was fancy. You could tell it was full of pompous rich kids. The bottom floor was more office-like, with a massive break room that had a few projectors displaying sports and some that had kids playing video games. There were pool tables and couches set up. It looked like a good hangout place. Beyond that, there were the bathrooms, the cafeteria, and so much more. The biggest rules we have here, obviously. No girls allowed in the male dorm. We don't want anyone getting pregnant and losing their trust funds, he said. You better not get anyone pregnant. My father's voice sounded off in my head. I can remember thinking. I was wondering when you were going to say something. What can I say? I've been busy, his voice replied. Richards led me to the elevator and pressed the button. I was enrolled as a senior. Seniors got to stay on the top floor. He hit the elevator button and we boarded. He looked at his clipboard and then me. He had explained several more of the rules as we walked. No girls, no pets, no eating in the dorms, no booze at all. Real basic stuff. I've got you in room 47D. Your roommate's name is... Oh boy. Ryan Armada. He sighed. Good luck with that. What's so bad about him? I asked. Richards turned to me with a raised brow and took a deep breath. Kids got a rap as kind of a weird one. You'll be fine. Just focus on your schoolwork. Things got quiet between us for a moment. But if he smuggles any animals into the dorm, please let me know. What the fuck? Lucifer's voice asked in my head. Okay, I said. The top floor was similar to that of a hotel. We walked through the halls until we eventually reached my room. We found the door open. A skinny teenager sat on his twin-sized bed in the corner, looking at his phone. Ryan, said Richards. Ryan eyed him, then me. He took a deep breath as he stood up. Ryan was a skinny kid with dark, disheveled hair. He had a bright, baby blue t-shirt and a thick pair of glasses. He shook my hand. You're Dante Grayson? He asked. Yeah, you're Ryan Armada. Ah, I see Richards has told you about me. He smiled. Uh, yeah, mentioned you like animals. Ryan laughed softly. Richards left the room. I may have smuggled a few birds in here last year. Oh shit, I asked. He shrugged. Richards wasn't a fan. He decorated his side of the room with what looked like pop and rock posters. I could see a stack of magazines that were all of National Geographic. We talked for a bit. He was the son of a senator in Pennsylvania, one who didn't really have time to spend with him. He also explained that he and his friends liked releasing animals in the dorms to mess with people. We hung out and got to know each other a bit better over the next few hours. We didn't start classes till the next day. I'd already gotten my schedule before I'd arrived. I had chemistry for my first period, which started at around 9 in the morning. We went down to the break room, where we met all the other boys who were playing video games or eating their dinner. This place feels more like a college than a high school, I said. This place is what happens when your parents don't have time for you, Ryan said. I rolled my eyes. This guy already gave off a problem with authority vibe. That was when Richard's voice boomed over the intercom. Alright everyone, the dean is here. Please make your way into the break room. A few minutes later, we were all watching an older woman called Glenda Holloway as she walked in. She was flanked on either side by two men. One she introduced as John. 
I didn't catch much about him. I was focused on the one I recognized. George Stapleton. I'd never met this guy in person. I'd only read ISDD files on him and heard the stories. George was the head of GSF. The only person he answered to was Adrian Stein. He was also an Omega soldier. One who had disgraced himself by betraying the horseman and helping Lilith steal the sword of Enoch. That was the story Marcus had told me. I can remember standing there, wondering why he was at the school. This is Mr. Stapleton, the dean stated. He's going to be the head of our security program this semester. I narrowed my eyes, then looked at Ryan, who only rolled his eyes. Glenda gave us our typical orientation speech, reiterated the same rules that Richards had told me. I watched her, but my mind was pondering why Stapleton was working security at a boarding school. After orientation was over, I went straight to my dorm. Ryan stayed downstairs. I grabbed my cell phone and sent a text to Trent. It said, Stapleton is head of school security. Trent's response was, Senator Armada requested GSF to be placed in charge of security. We just got intel from Valentine. Should we pull the plug? I texted back. No, lay low, hit the panic button if anything goes wrong. Ophelia and I will come get you. I nodded at this. The panic button was exactly that, a button on my phone. I also had a backup that was disguised as a pen, one I kept in my back pocket at all times. It was a neat little device. It was an actual pen. It also had an EMP charge, so if I needed to knock the power out somewhere, just click it three times. The panic button was twice. I met Grace and Angie in the morning on the way to class. They'd had similar reactions to Stapleton being there that I'd had. I had chemistry first period. Grace did as well. The school building was a two-story complex, the wings organized by their subjects. History in one, math in another, science in another. The science hall was very basic in design. Our class was set up like your typical science classroom. The teacher was called Mr. Chisholm. He sat at the front desk and waited for us all to sit down. I could smell the coffee he was drinking. It was black and absolutely no creamer whatsoever. I sat down. Grace sat next to me. Our class had maybe 14 kids in it. Two of them were persons of interest. Maya Harkin, who was the daughter of the head of DARPA, and my roommate, Ryan Armada. It really put a light on the kid in my mind that his father had requested Gideon security. There was no way his father wasn't involved with the cult. I wondered if Ryan was, but then I remembered him complaining about his parents not giving him attention. He and Maya sat together at the front of the class. All was quiet. I could hear the heartbeats of those around me. Everyone was calm, steady even, except Grace. Her heart was beating a mile a minute. I turned and looked at her. Are you okay? I asked. She leaned over to me. I've never been inside a classroom. I looked at her with a raised brow. She shrugged. I admit, at that moment, I did wonder what the point was in sending her along. If she flunked out of a class, she'd get some unwanted attention. That class was admittedly boring as hell. As were the next two, trigonometry and history. I had lunch next, then my elective class, which was a theater arts class, then an actual art class as my second elective. I suppose now is a good time to describe the school in a bit more detail. As stated earlier, it was a two-story complex. It was made from a white colored stone. The walls in each hallway were lined with blue painted lockers. There were paintings of the school mascot, the Hamilton Academy Dragons. The mascot was a blue dragon with blazing red eyes. It was painted on the wall above the line of lockers. The school campus was in a small town with a lot of surrounding woodlands. I found myself walking back to the dorms for lunch. Ryan walked beside me. That trigonometry class is going to suck, he complained. I laughed softly. He looked at me. What? I hate math. I don't know anyone that doesn't. He shrugged. We were outside, and the summer sun was beating down on us. We had a whole hour for lunch. 
We walked into the dorm cafeteria. I could see Richard eating some kind of homemade burrito at one of the tables. It was then that I realized that our senior class was kind of small. We had our own lunch. There were only maybe 20 to 30 guys in the cafeteria. How many kids go to the school? I asked. Less than 200. Part of being a private facility, I guess. Ryan mumbled. I thought for a minute. I needed to meet more people. To get my job done, the more friends I made, the better. So, what is there to do around here, other than the game room? I asked. Ryan smiled at me. I thought you'd never ask. A few hours later, I was standing with Ryan at a massive bonfire. We were in the woods, maybe a mile from the school. It was a party. There were 30 to 40 kids there. There was also a loudspeaker blaring some music. I stared into the fire. The orange flames danced up and down the blackened locks. It made me think of hell. Of my lineage. I was the son of Lucifer, and it was terrifying. I told myself constantly that I was in control, but I would be remiss if I said there wasn't a part of me that enjoyed spilling blood. I thought of our battles against Lilith's hordes at the Crawford Mall. I'd been elated and angry at the same time while I cut them down. It terrified me. Owen, Lucifer's voice whispered. Enjoying the party? What do you want? I asked. You're pitying yourself again. It's disgusting. What do you know about it? <laughs> I know enough. I am the devil after all. Fuck off. Look at you. So angry. Do you smell the air? That stench of sulfur? There are demons here. I'd been wondering what that smell was as Ryan and I walked out here. I looked around. Ryan was talking to a girl as they sat on a lock. They were both giggling. That was when I realized that girl was Angie. I scoffed. He did not know what tree he was barking up. Hey, a voice caught my attention. I turned. Grace stood next to me, looking into the fire as well. She looked bored. Maybe a little aggravated. You smell that? I asked. The sulfur was the first thing I noticed. You think someone here is possessed? I asked. Grace shrugged. Even if they are, what could we do? I nodded. How are you doing? She asked. I can hear you over here talking. Is it? Yeah, he won't shut up sometimes. I said. That's rude, Owen. Lucifer said. You find anything today? I asked. Nothing of note. The art teacher is a little weird though. She smells funny. Gray said. I remember walking into art class earlier that day. My first impression of Miss Hall was that she was stunningly beautiful. She had long blonde hair and a slender frame. She smiled at me as I entered. I sat down and we had class. Hell, even Lucifer had something to say when we saw her. Why is all the blood rushing away from your brain, my boy? He asked. That took me out of my trance. I hadn't noticed a smell though, not even as she got up to teach. She carried herself with grace. She went over the syllabus and then, yeah, class went by. We didn't really interact. What she smell like? I asked. Grace thought for a second. Like, uh... You ever had an infection? Like an infected cut? That doesn't really clear things up, but I'll keep an eye on her. Although, I'm pretty sure Trent put you in charge, I said with a smile. He did, but school is a whole new thing for me. I heard Ryan grunt in pain behind me. I turned, and Angie had grabbed his crotch and squeezed it. Grace scoffed. I'm sure he deserved it, I said. Yeah, she said. I approached them cautiously and with a smile. Angie let go. I see you've met my sister, I said. This is your sister? He said. I nodded. Angie got to her feet and walked past me. I need another drink, she said. I looked down on Ryan. What happened? 
I think I drank too much. Sober now, though, he said, before grunting in pain. I chuckled as I put my hand on his shoulder. You okay? He nodded. I turned and looked around the crowd some more. I could see kids dancing and drinking. I watched as a young girl in a red dress led a young boy off into the woods. I rolled my eyes. That seemed to be asking for poison ivy. A minute or two went by. I could feel my tail wiggle. That was when I heard something slightly over the music. Was that? Was that a scream? I looked over at Grace. Her eyes were white and on me. She had heard it too. I listened harder. It came again. It was loud and guttural, but the kids around me seemed none the wiser. I looked down at Ryan. I'll be right back, I said as I turned and walked into the woods. The air was humid and that damn sulfur stink was getting worse. Grace had gone in behind me. She was a few steps back. The music faded behind us the further we walked. Then came the scream again. It was one of agony. I took off in a sprint, brushing branches out of my face before bursting into a small clearing. That was where I found Red Dress and her male accomplice. She was standing over him. His gray t-shirt was covered in blood. Her eyes locked onto me as I exited the brush. She smiled widely. It was then that I noticed the dagger in her hand and the gaping wound in his chest. What is this? Another meat bag? She hissed as she stepped off of him. The boy suddenly sat up, his eyes black as night. He smiled at me as well. That was when Grace emerged from the brush. Oh shit, she said. They're 100% possessed, I said. Grace didn't say anything. She merely reached into the satchel she'd been wearing and pulled a small knife. The possessed boy laughed. Azos, I think they mean to fight. His voice was deep and raspy. Azos? I heard Lucifer's voice in my head. They let that imp up here? They watched us closely for a second. We watched them, the boy on his feet now, and the girl was twirling her knife. Any ideas? I asked. Grace readied her knife. We killed them both. Fair enough, I said as I raised one hand and blasted both possessed people with black Gehenian flames. Both of them were practically vaporized on contact. Had they been in their demonic forms, they'd have been able to somewhat withstand it. But they were in human bodies. All that was left was a pile of ash and the dagger. I stood there for a moment, smiling at my sadistic work. My father laughed with glee in my brain. Grace walked over and picked up the dagger. The whole thing was an obsidian black color. It had what looked like a goat head carved into the pommel. She looked at it for a moment, then pressed her finger to her watch. Trent, you there? Yeah? Trent's voice replied. Owen just roasted two possessed kids. They've got some kind of dagger. Sending an image now, she said as she scanned it with her watch. A second or two passed. I've got it. Abel? That was when Abel's voice came on. It looks like one of the ceremonial daggers of Chernobog. One of? I asked. There are three of them. Chernobog is the son of a possessed human and a rogue god. He has the ability to summon demons into dead human bodies. All of his daggers have that ability as well. What was the last known location of Chernobog? Asked Trent. Last Keeper report has him in Greece, just before the Battle of Tokyo, with Artemis and Stapleton. They had an encounter with the European Lightbender chapter. There's a good chance he's here at the school, with Stapleton being the head of security and all. I said. That's a possibility. Grace agreed. Either way, they're murdering kids and possessing them. I get the parents, but why the kids? Asked Trent. That's what we need to find out. Another thing, when you kill those two demons, their essence went back to hell. There's a good chance they told their higher-ups what they saw. What do you mean? I asked. You're going to have to stay on your toes. They know you're there now. That made my heart rate escalate a bit. That meant they knew who we were. We didn't even know what they all looked like or how many were possessed. It got quiet. 
If you guys want us to pull the plug, we will, said Trent. I thought for a moment. Not yet. If we can't find those other two blades, then more kids are going to die, I said. What about Stapleton? He'll figure out who you are. The man has a direct tie to Aberon. Let me worry about him, said Trent. What do you plan to do? Asked Abel. He's the head of security, right? I'm gonna make him do his job. With that, we went back to the party. Grace would explain what happened to Angie. The party was a bit more tense after that. I didn't know at all who we could trust, so I assumed no one, not even Ryan. We would all go to our bed in our dorms that night, all paranoid about what could happen next. We were paranoid for the next few days. I was barely able to get into a routine. Grace kept the dagger. Ryan and I hung out a lot. He introduced me to some of his other friends. There was Mac, the son of some senator in Tennessee. April, the daughter of a governor in Virginia. And Reyes, the son of an industrialist. They were an interesting bunch, to say the least. They had all met in theater class. We all sat around in that class. I watched the teacher, Miss Trail, as she helped another student with his homework. I thought about our art class. I'd watched Miss Hall. I still couldn't identify the smell Grace had noticed. To me, she smelled fantastic, like sugary perfume. That bothered me a bit. I was lost in thought about this. Reyes was prattling at Ryan about something. I stood up and went to the bathroom, walking out into the hall and past the two missing person posters showing the possessed teenagers at Roasted the week prior. I walked further down the hallway and into the bathroom. I didn't really have to go, I just wanted a moment to think. I sat down in a stall. I'd wrap my tail around my midsection. I'd become accustomed to it being there. It was always sweaty, but I dealt with it. It was hard to room someone with it. I always had to wear big shirts. Ryan never really seemed to notice. I let my tail unwrap itself from around my waist, let it air out. I sat in the stall. That was when the smell hit me. Sulfur. I got to my feet and put my tail back. The smell was strong and invasive. That was when I heard what sounded like a muffled grunt, followed by a rhythmic thumping. I exited the stall. I looked around the bathroom slowly. I was the only person inside. The sound was coming from inside the wall next to me. That was Miss Hart's art class. I narrowed my eyes as I exited the bathroom. The classrooms had no windows that led into the hall, aside from the one on the door, which I approached slowly as to get a view. The rhythmic thumping grew stronger and stronger as I walked closer and closer to it. That was when I realized that the grunts I heard weren't actually grunts. They were moans. I found myself at the door, where I peered through the window. I could see Miss Hall. She was bent over her desk, while Richards went to town on her from behind. My eyes widened. Then they widened even more when she locked eyes with me. I didn't say anything. I just walked off very quickly. What the fuck was that? Richards? That was disgusting. I could hear Lucifer laughing in my head as I made my way back to class. I didn't tell any of Ryan's friends what I'd seen, nor did I tell Ryan. The bell rang 45 minutes later. When we walked into the hallway, we found EMTs in Miss Hall's room. Richards was being taken out on a stretcher. I can remember the crowd gathered. I can remember my ears ringing when I saw him leaving. I can remember making eye contact with Miss Hall, who only smiled and waved at me. I walked back to the dorm and went to my room. There, I heard Lucifer's voice. Miss Hall was too much for good old Richard to handle. Makes sense with her being a succubus and all. Wait, you knew? I asked. Uh, yeah, she used to work for me. I narrowed my eyes as I walked into the bathroom and looked in the mirror. Instead of my own reflection, I saw that of my father. He stood there with his hands clasped together. Only one of his arms was mostly rotted flesh and bone. You know your arm is a… Yeah. I gotta find someone else's to tear off, 
I thought about doing it to the guards, but uh, they gave me brownies. I rolled my eyes. Then he sighed. She took on a nice body. You knew the whole time? I asked. Eh, I was suspicious, but I figured it out whenever Grace described her smell. A succubus gives off a pungent odor to those of a more feminine nature. To males, their smells are like a strong pheromone. You're lucky she didn't target you, said Lucifer. I'm afraid, she may now. We saw her with Richards, remember? I said. Lucifer shrugged. Then, clap the hell out of them cheeks, my boy. I groaned as I turned around. What, she won't be able to kill you? No, just fuck me until Stapleton can come capture my ass. Lucifer shrugged again. I don't see why you couldn't just kill him. I mean, hell, you've had the thought. Just kill everyone on campus, demon or not. It'll be for the greater good. Genocide isn't good, no matter how well intended. I said. Oh, but you want to. I can smell the blood lost on you. No one could stop you. Not Grace. Not Trent. Not Abel. Not even Angie. Fuck you. I growled. He put his bony hand to his chest and mocked, being offended. I'm not the succubus. He fake gasped. I pressed my lips together. If Miss Hall is a succubus, how do I eliminate her? You don't. You have your people capture and interrogate her, Lucifer said. I narrowed my eyes. That's actually a good idea. Look at you. He shrugged again. I may be evil, but I'm not useless. I contacted Trent via text and let him know about the situation. I received the text in response to stay away from her. I was then notified that Aisha and Megan would be dispatched to deal with the succubus. That honestly made me breathe a slight sigh of relief. Then, the speaker in my room went off. This is Mr. Stapleton. I need all of those staying in the male dorms to report downstairs for a meeting. That made my heart jump into my throat. I knew that it was about Richards. I hoped the man was okay. I went downstairs. All the boys were in the cafeteria where Stapleton stood at the front. He had his arms crossed. He was flanked on one side by a tall and skinny black guy, and on the other side by a tall blonde woman. I'd seen the woman before, in ISDD files labeled Artemis. I'm sure you guys have heard what happened with Mr. Richards. It's a terrible thing. The dean has asked me to inform you that in his absence, my friend here will be taking a spot, he said, gesturing to the black man beside him. This is Andre, he said. I looked the man up and down. Was he Chernobog? I wondered. Andre stepped in the front. Look everyone, I know this is a difficult time. If any of you guys want to talk, my door is always open. He said in a surprisingly soft tone. With that, we broke off and went back to our rooms. Ryan walked with Reyes and Mac. I was a few steps behind them. Did you hear about someone slashing all four of Stapleton's tires yesterday? Reyes asked. I hit my smirk. I heard someone spray painted a dick on his office door, said Mac. That sounded like Grayson trolling, harmless pranks that seemed like they'd be pulled by a teenager, enough to annoy the absolute hell out of Stapleton, keep his attention. Ryan went into Mac and Reyes' dorm. I lied and said I was tired and headed to mine. I opened the door and walked in, my eyes bulging in my head when they locked onto Miss Hall laying on my bed in a bra and underwear. What are you doing here? I asked. Hello Dante, she said as she sat up and started to strip one of the straps of her bra off. I know you saw me and Mr. Richards. Y you need to leave, I stammered. You need to clap them cheeks, Lucifer's voice said. Aww. She said as she pressed her lips. She stood up and slinked toward me. I took a step back. Why are you so upset? Richards just couldn't handle all this. She said as she ran her hands all over her body. Her face got close to mine. I could smell her. Her aphrodisiac scent made my blood rush. Part of me wanted to on instinct. Come on, Dante. Don't... My tail shot out and snaked around her throat before lifting her off the ground. Her eyes bulged 
but her lips smiled. I knew you looked familiar, she gasped. She raised her hand, and I felt an invisible force push me back. I flew back, but stopped before I hit my door. My tail was still around her throat. She was still smiling. I felt rage building up in my gut. I wanted to kill her now. And here I thought you were only into missionary. She smiled. My tail tightened. I could feel the bones buckling in her neck. Then a thought flashed in my brain. I couldn't just kill her. We needed her. I groaned with annoyance, then snapped my fingers. We were suddenly in Trent's hotel room, where he was standing at the bathroom door with a toothbrush still halfway in his mouth and a towel wrapped around his waist. He looked at me for a second, then the succubus, who looked over at him and smiled. Ooh, a threesome. Trent pulled the toothbrush from his mouth and pointed it at the other side of the room, where Ophelia was entering with Megan and Aisha behind her. Miss Hall put both her hands up, perhaps knowing she was 100% going to die if she fought, or maybe knowing that she was simply outmatched. Two hours later, we had her tied to a warded chair. I watched with Trent and Aisha as Megan and Ophelia interrogated her. Aisha and Megan had given me instruction on how to use my powers. Aisha had been a great mentor for my angelic lineage. Megan taught me the more magical side of things. I'd learned how to teleport and summon my weapon through her. I'd learned how to sword fight from Trent and Marcus. Where is Marcus? I asked. Doing horseman shit, said Trent. He had his arms crossed. So she followed you into your room because you saw her nailing your RA? Basically. Then you teleported her here, and the first thing she tried to do was have a threesome? She's a succubus, it's what they do. I turned my attention to Megan, who had her hand on Miss Hall's head. What's she doing? Getting the names of all the possessed staff and kits. Once we have them, we might be able to track the other two daggers. Trent said as his cell phone dinged. He pulled it and took a deep breath. Derek's giving Anne fits. I'll be right back. He said as he walked off. I watched him go. Aisha scoffed. Ophelia says he's been using that excuse to check on him constantly. What? I asked. He's worried about his son. I guess when you've seen the awfulness of the universe, Aisha said. You ever think about having kids? I asked. She crossed her arms and sighed. Those thoughts died with Keith. I turned and watched the interrogation. Megan's eyes went white. The succubus let out an awful screech, then went limp. Megan looked at Ophelia. We got him. She said. We had gotten a list and cross-referenced it with the list of families we had gotten from Cain's son. What we'd gotten were the names of six possessed individuals in the school. Two were students, the rest were staff. We also got the names of the ones who had the daggers. One was a student. The other wasn't even involved with the school. But his son gave me pause. Because that person was Senator Armada. And... I was rooming with his son. I teleported back to school. Ryan still hadn't come back to our room. I took the time to study the list of names, particularly the name of the one with the dagger. Bella Demos. The ISDD had gotten a picture of her from the school's database. She was a tiny blunt senior. She was also rooming on the same floor as Angie and Grace, who would skip class and break into a room. On a break, they explained that the room was warded to prevent people from teleporting inside. Luckily, Grace knew how to pick the lock. They didn't find the knife though, but they did plant some recording devices in the room. I looked over the list. We knew that the possessed weren't the only threats. There was Stapleton, Artemis, and Andre, who we confirmed was not Chernobyl. We actually didn't know who Andre was. Not yet, at least. We would find ourselves at a pep rally a few weeks later. The football team at the school wasn't great. That doesn't matter. It was when Bella came out to give a speech about the homecoming dance next week that got my attention. She stood with the dean. Dean Glenda Holloway was also on the list of possessed, as was Miss Trail and a few teachers from classes I didn't have. So, as you know, our homecoming dance will be next Saturday. That being said, Today, I wanted to honor our sponsors. Our biggest sponsor, 
Senator Armada has donated enough for us to actually have live music. He's also agreed to chaperone. What? Ryan asked from next to me. I turned to him with a raised brow. My father would never, he said. He didn't even tell me. That made me think a bit. I wondered if Ryan even knew his father was possessed. I'd assumed so. I'd kept quiet and kept an eye on him. His friends too. We sat high up in the bleachers in the gym for this pep rally. But I swore Bella was staring at Ryan as she talked about his dad. She went over a few more announcements. It seemed all the possessed were going to be in one place. The homecoming dance. This provided a unique opportunity. The only issue was that we had to get them together and isolate it from the kids. We left the pep rally and headed back toward our dorm. My head was swimming with thoughts and ideas. I needed to contact Trent. I walked down the school hallway toward the exit when something grabbed my arm and yanked me into a classroom. I found myself staring into the black eyes of a possessed chemistry teacher, Mr. Chisholm. I readied myself for a fight. Alarm bells in my mind were blaring because he wasn't on the list. Whoa, whoa, wait, he shouted. My fists erupted in black flame. That won't be necessary, Mr. Knight. I'm not here to hurt you. What? I asked in confusion. I am Malik, crowned prince of hell. I, uh, I'm the reason why your cover hasn't been blown. What do you mean? I demanded. Who do you think the possessed you scorched report to? Ever wonder why you and your friends haven't been as fucked into oblivion? Why would you help me? I hold no loyalty to Abaddon, not after the rebellion. I heard rumors about you, the vessel of the true king. I am to serve so that Gehenna may be restored. I could hear Lucifer cackle in my mind. What a cuck. I didn't trust this demon at all. Who would? He was a demon. A demon prince at that. I stared at him for a minute. You wish to serve Lucifer? Then help me get the daggers. He raised a brow. Why do you need the daggers? To keep them from raising more demons. He nodded. Well, Ara has one. She's in possession of that Bella girl. She's a real firecracker in hell. Young and ambitious. Yes, and the other one is with Senator Armada. They're both going to be at the dance. I said. He nodded. They are. They intend to take your roommate there as well. I gritted my teeth. Get them all in the room together. I said. I'll take care of the rest. What about Stapleton and his goon squad? Asked the demon prince. I have people for that. This wouldn't happen to be the same people that keep vandalizing his car? He asked. I scoffed. That was when the classroom door opened and Andre walked in. Hey, Mr. Chisholm. Everything okay? Yes. I was just discussing with Dante here about some extra credit work. Uh-huh. Is that true, Dante? He asked. I looked at Mr. Chisholm, then at Andre. Yeah, trying to get my 92 up to a 96. Andre smirked, then walked off. I looked back up at Mr. Chisholm. I'll see what I can do, he said. With that, I left. I texted Trent about it from my dorm. I felt exhausted. This whole thing had been exhausting. Granted, it was good to know that the possessed weren't completely aware of who we were. Then I fell asleep. I found myself in a black void. I groaned as I knew I was coming. Lucifer, I said as I heard the shuffle of feet behind me. My boy, he replied. I turned and glared. I'm guessing you're wanting to talk about Malik, I said. He shrugged. I can hear your thoughts, remember? You're wondering if he's trustworthy. Is he? He's a demon, so no. If there's one thing Malik is loyal to, it's Malik. He's a groveling leech. Meaning? I asked. He says he's upset about the recent rebellion in hell, but Abaddon squashed it. So either he's lying... Or Abaddon is losing control of his own dimension. My dimension. So what? Lucifer shrugged. I actually don't know. I think your best bet is to give in to the bloodlust and kill everything. It's the only way to be sure. I rolled my eyes. He chuckled. Then I was suddenly jolted awake. 
I opened my eyes to see Ryan standing over me. He had a weird look on his face. I actually thought he was about to attack me for a moment. He exhaled and sat down. Your sister just called me. Ask me to wake you up, he said. You have my sister's number? I asked. He shrugged. I could tell his mind wasn't really there. I looked at my cell phone, which had like four missed calls from Trent and three from Grace. I walked outside with Ryan, where we found Angie and Grace. Angie walked up to Ryan. You okay? She asked. He nodded. Yeah, he said softly. Dante, let's talk. Give them some alone time, Grace said. Grace led me to the nearest tree line. We stood under a tree. It was about dusk outside, so there weren't very many people in the area. We were out of sight. That was when Trent's nemesis suit uncloaked behind the tree. He stepped out. You suck at answering your phone sometimes, he said. Yeah, I fell asleep. We know, both he and Grace said at the same time. So, the dance is where we make our move. If he can get the demons in one room, we can wipe them out, he said. If, I said. If he doesn't, we'll kill him and figure it out ourselves. I'll be there cloaked in my suit. Ophelia will be cloaked as well. The rest of the team will be on standby in case things get bad. Trent reassured us. I nodded. I was honestly relieved that this was almost over. Granted, we still had questions that needed to be answered. Why were they possessing kids? Was it to hold them hostage for the parents? Where was Chernobog? I should have asked Malik, but I hadn't remembered. I figured I could when I saw him again. There was a lot of planning and scouting in the days leading up to the dance. Angie and Grace stalked Bella. The demon was good at the whole mean girl persona. I kept my eye on the other possessed student. His name was Elmo Skittle. He was the son of some guy who had become internet famous for a story he had appeared in about his encounter with an alligator man. I'd seen the clip on YouTube a few times. It was… strange. Elmo was good friends with Mac. They were both on the same debate team. I spent a lot of time with Grace too. So much so that Ryan actually asked me if we were together. We weren't. Not because I didn't find Grace attractive. She was. She was very attractive. We both had trauma. But just over a year prior, I'd watched the only person I'd had a semblance of a romantic relationship with get blasted by Lilith. Things went smoothly for a few days. At least until the night before the dance. I'd been in the shower when there was a loud bang on our dorm room door. I heard Ryan open it. Then I heard his voice. Hey, hey dad, he said. Ryan, buddy, I thought I'd come say hi. Uh-huh, why? Oh, you know, just wanted to check up on my favorite senior. You've never called me that, Ryan said. I could hear the hostility in his voice. I know. Look, I'm just... I know I haven't been a great father. I want to make it up to you. You want to join me for dinner? There's a nice burger joint up the road. Aren't you vegetarian? Ryan asked. I'm trying new things. Come on, Ryan. Don't make your old man beg. Fine, fine. I'll come. Let me get ready. Okay, I'll be in the lobby, Senator Armada said. I heard the door close. I knew I couldn't let Ryan go. I hurried out of the shower, then stuck my head out of the door. Who was that? I asked. My dad. He wants to have burgers. I raised a brow. Part of me wanted to tell him, but I wasn't sure how he'd take the news. What was I supposed to say? Hey, your dad's a demon and wants to sacrifice you and let your corpse be possessed. How was I supposed to prove that? Orion sat on his bed and thought for a minute. I could tell he was conflicted on how he felt. I don't get it. He hasn't texted me. He hasn't talked to me. Not since mom died. Now he suddenly wants to be involved? Ah, just. He took a deep breath. You know, it's funny. I would have killed for this kind of attention a few months ago. But now, I don't. I don't want it. I lived my whole life wishing he was proud of me. And he sent me away to fucking boarding school because I reminded him of mom. I started to exit the bathroom. Then I remembered my tail was out. 
If you don't want to go, you don't have to go, I said. I can't say no. Say you don't feel good. No, I should do this, he said. I took a deep breath. I didn't want to sound desperate. I also certainly couldn't tag along. I sighed, knowing the moment he left, I was going to call Trent and tell to myself if I had to. Orion left before I got my clothes on. I called Trent as I went to our dorm room window and looked outside. I could see Ryan getting into a limo with his dad. And Bella. Shit. I barked. Trent didn't answer his phone, so I teleported outside. I tried calling again as I watched the limo leave. He didn't answer. Damn it. I barked as I pulled the pen from my back pocket. I watched them as they pulled up to a stop sign. This was my moment. I snapped my fingers, teleporting just behind the truck of the limo and ducking. I clicked the pen three times. The car suddenly shut off. I took a deep breath. I could hear the driver exit. He opened the hood and looked at it while Senator Armada and Ryan exited the vehicle. Well, that's unfortunate, he said. I could feel my tail wiggle. I snapped my fingers and teleported to the rooftop of the nearest building, which happened to be the school itself. What now? Ryan asked. Armada looked at his cell phone. Phone's out too. Strange. I breathed a sigh of relief. They couldn't wisp him away now. Well, it's no matter, Bella said. I watched closely. They were both right there. I could take them, kill them. I could feel it in my insides. The hunger for violence. I was just about to teleport and go on the attack when Bella suddenly produced a dagger and shoved it into Ryan's stomach. He screamed loudly. No! I started to scream just as a hand clasped around my mouth. I watched as Ryan's father took his dagger and shoved it into his son's back. Ryan was somehow still alive, his screams turning into incoherent backs, the look of complete and utter betrayal on his face. You can't help him, Chisholm's voice said in my ear. Ryan was dragged into the back seat of the limo, where Bella and his own father continued their bloody work. I turned and shoved Malik away from me. I was about to engage. I was gonna teleport over there and fry the fuckers. If you killed them, then you'd be dooming everyone at the dance tomorrow. Malik sneered. I stopped and turned. Their plan? Why they want these kids? You never asked, he said. I tilted my head at him. I was just about ready to fry him as well. They're the ones performing the ceremony. If they're not there, the rest have orders to kill everyone. Why? What ceremony? It's for a mass possession spell. It doesn't matter. I'm going to call them all into a meeting before the ceremony so you can wipe them out. Why do they want to possess the kids? Most of the kids who go here have parents who are part of the Apollyon Guild. Their children trade it for the wealth and power bestowed upon them. It's a simple transaction really. Gehenna gets their souls and their meat suits. The family name gets a bright future. We've been doing it since World War II. You think Gideon is the only way we sway policy in this country? You said mass possession spell? You need to kill them in order to possess them. Malak shrugged. They plan on doing that too. But don't worry, I have plans of my own. I don't trust you, I growled. Malak smirked. I wish only to serve the true king. He snapped his fingers and vanished. I stood on the roof, watching as Ryan stepped out of the car, his body very clearly possessed. I could smell the sulfur from the rooftop. I snapped my fingers and teleported back to our dorm. I texted Trent and the girls about what had happened. The girls texted back. Trent never replied. I wondered what had happened to him. I hoped they hadn't been compromised. All there was left to do now was wait. Wait for Ryan. Wait for the dance. I could hear his footsteps moving down the hallway. I pretended I was passed out when I heard the door open. My heart was beating a hundred miles a minute. I wondered if I should run, or if I should incinerate him. He simply walked inside the room. I heard his footsteps walk over to my bed and stop. He looked down at me for a moment. Then I could hear the footsteps returning to his bed. He laid down. I exhaled, my hands still gripping the pen tight. 
I'd been tempted to activate the panic button, but I stayed my hand. I didn't sleep that night, not even after Ryan awoke at 6am and left. I instead shot out of my bed and grabbed my phone. I tried to call Trent again. This time, he answered. Where the fuck have you been? I asked. I'm sorry, Owen. The Secretary of Defense was killed last night. What? I asked as my heart dropped. Check the news. We're pretty sure it was the crow. Secretary Valentine had played a major role in keeping the US government out of our ass. Between her, General Elliot, and Ellen Jones, we'd been able to steer clear of a ton of political backlash, even for Tokyo. Granted, there were those on the news that wanted the ISDD shut down. I knew what a big deal this was. I'd see the video later. Valentine was in the middle of a fiery speech when a crack rang out. She suddenly crumpled to the ground like a sack of potatoes. She'd been shot in the forehead, her brain splattered on the American flag portrait behind her. That left another issue. Grace was in the school as her fake niece. I wondered if that would have any effect on our operation. I'd been given a tux by the ISDD for the dance. It had a rat jacket, white undershirt with a black bow tie and pants. I didn't see Ryan the rest of the day before the dance. It was probably for the best though. I can remember maybe an hour before. There was a knock on my dorm room. I answered it and found both Mac and Reyes standing there. Both looked concerned. What's up? I asked. We've been trying to get a hold of Ryan all day. Is he okay? He left early this morning, I replied. Where did he go? Wish I knew. Reyes thought for a moment, then looked at his friend. This isn't like him. I wanted to tell them both. I really did. I took a deep breath. He's been acting different ever since he hung out with his dad last night, I said. Reyes' eyes went white. He hates his dad. They went out? I nodded. The two looked at each other. Look, I'm sure he'll catch up with you later, I said. I hope so. We need him for the ceremony. Ceremony? I asked, my heart rate increasing. Yeah, he didn't tell you? He wanted to release a bunch of mice onto the dance floor. I narrowed my eyes. Where are the mice? I asked. In a box, in the biology lab. He really didn't tell you? I'd remembered Ryan saying something about Ubering to the pet store for some project. I thought it was for school. I mean, I guess it was. I wasn't sure why he hadn't told me. I looked at his friends for a moment. There was a long, uncomfortable silence that followed. I'll see you guys at the dance, I said before shutting the door. I turned around only to find Michael sitting on my bed, reading one of Ryan's National Geographic magazines. Mike? Why are you here? I asked. He smiled and raised a brow at me. There are demons amongst us. Where else would I be? This is below your pay grade. Nothing involving my daughter or you is below my pay grade. Trent wanted me to check on you. I know yesterday was difficult. I sat down in Ryan's bed across from him. He had a t-shirt and jeans on. He certainly didn't look like an angel, just a really cool uncle. He only wanted his dad to love him. It wasn't fair. Michael sighed. Life is often not, even for beings like us. It doesn't matter how much control you try to exert over a situation. Sometimes, things just aren't fair. I scoffed. You'd think with beings like Father Time, we'd be able to stack the cards in our favor. He shrugged. We certainly try, but like I said, it's not always fair. We play the hands we're dealt and move on. You couldn't save him. It sucks. It hurts. That feeling will linger for a while. Mike leaned forward towards me. But will you use it to wallow in self-pity? Or will you learn from it? Will you drown yourself in it? Or will you choose to rise above it and find your full potential? We gotta finish the job, I said. Mike nodded again. Eh, I always hated those speeches. Lucifer's voice echoed in my brain. Michael tilted his head. Tell your father to shut the hell up. You can hear him? I asked. Yes, he's obnoxious. That we agree on. 
Mike and I talked for about five more minutes before he went to go and speak with Angie and Grace. He would explain that Trent and Ophelia were already cloaked and invisible inside the school, Ophelia using an Atlantean cloaking device. The dance was happening in the gymnasium. I met Grace and Angie at the entrance. I had an earpiece in, as did they. We had clear communication. I could hear the music and see the lights from outside of the school. We were supposed to wait for Chisholm's signal before getting to work. That signal was supposed to come maybe 30 minutes into the dance, which was when the possessed were to meet to start the ritual. So I had 30 minutes to move about the crowd. Inside was like your typical high school dance party. I don't remember the song that was playing as we walked in. I can remember Angie went to the dance floor. Grace and I watched. We could smell the sulfur in the air. It didn't take long for me to get a beat on Bella, who was dancing with Ryan. I could also see Senator Armada over by the table where they were serving non-alcoholic beverages. I spotted Elmo dancing with some random girl. Trail and the other two afflicted teachers were there, as well as the dean. Whole party is here, Trent's voice said through my comlink. My eyes drifted to Chisholm, who pointed his finger at his watch. We had 15 minutes left. What do we do? I asked. Stay on your toes, but blend in. A slow song had started, and people had begun coupling up. I felt Grace grab me and yank me toward the dance floor. She put her arms around my neck, and we began to slow dance. I looked at her for a second or two. He said to blend in. She said with a smirk. Uh Uh-huh, I replied. My eyes scanned behind her. There were kids everywhere. I could still see Ryan dancing with Bella. Strangely enough, I couldn't see Reyes or Mac. I hadn't spotted April either. I'd imagined they went and grabbed their chaos starter from the biolab. We danced for a moment. I hadn't danced with a girl since my days in Crawford High. That had been with Sarah. I still missed Sarah from time to time. I mean, who wouldn't? She only died. I could tell that Grace had learned to dance, but I knew from hanging out with her from time to time that she'd never had a boyfriend or had even kissed a guy. Is this the first time you've danced with a man? I asked. She smirked. You're not a man yet, Owen. I rolled my eyes and smiled. You're only a year older than me, and for right now, my name is Dante. I'm a year and a half older than you. Fine. Is this your first time dancing with a guy who isn't your father? Slow dancing? Yes. Ah, I said. And it happens to be in the middle of a dance infested with possessed people. She laughed softly. I looked around. I could see Malik watching us. I looked back at Grace. Her green eyes were locked onto my own. I can remember thinking about how good she'd looked with the blonde hair. I could feel my heart stutter a bit. I'd forgotten that she was half a vampire. She could sense it. She smirked at me. You okay? She asked. I smiled. Totally. She smirked and moved her face closer to mine. My heart stuttered again. She moved her mouth to one side of my head. I could feel her hand on my chest right above my heart. That's what I thought. She whispered. She was clearly trying to fuck with me. I was honestly surprised Lucifer hasn't said anything. My eyes locked onto Malik, who motioned his head. I looked past Grace at Bella and Ryan, who were following Senator Armada and the Dean out of the gymnasium and into the hallway. It's go time, I said softly. Stapleton just entered the building with Artemis. We're moving to intercept. Trent's voice said into comms. We're going after the targets. We kept our distance as we followed the figures out of the dance and into the hallway. The lights in the rest of the school were off. We watched as they made their way towards the science wing. Then, the four entered the biolab. My eyes went white. The lights in the biolab classroom were on. As we got closer and closer, I could hear chanting. I could also hear crying, muffled crying, like someone with tape over their mouth was trying to scream. We eventually made it to the doorway. I peeked through. I could see all seven possessed figures. I could also see the silhouettes of three teenagers on their knees. I recognized them. Reyes, Mac, and April. Bella was chanting something and holding one of the daggers. She stood over Mac. 
I kicked in the door and stormed into the room. All the possessed turned to me. My eyes locked onto Ryan, who had one of the mice in his hand. He smiled at me as he put its head in his mouth and bit down hard. There was a squeal and then a wet squelch. Hello, Owen, Bella said sharply. I stormed into the middle of the room, Grace behind me with a knife in her hand. I took a step forward, readying myself to unleash my black fire and incinerate all of them. Then I noticed something. Malek was pinned to the wall by two of the demons. He looked strange. Ryan swallowed as he dropped the rest of the mouse's body. I looked down, seeing that I'd landed on a warding symbol. In fact, the whole room was covered in symbols painted in blood. My legs and arms suddenly felt heavy. It's an immobilization spell, quite hard to pull off, if I do say so myself. Especially on a being as powerful as you, Dean Holloway said. I turned to Grace, only to find that she had been pinned to the wall by the possessed Trail, who was using some telekinesis to keep her there. It was a blood magic spell, a nasty one at that. Megan had taught me about it. It had been nearly impossible to pull off for a human. It made my body stiffen. I felt like all the energy had been sucked out of me. I tried to step forward, but my legs wouldn't move. I tried to raise my arm to burn them, but it wouldn't move either. I tried to snap my fingers, but the entire room was covered in bloody warding symbols. Ryan casually walked toward me. Owen oh, Knight, son of the former king, did you think that you just walk in here and roast all of us to death? Ryan motioned for Bella to continue. She brought her dagger down hard on Mac. He screamed and cried as she stabbed him over and over again. Eventually, he stopped moving. I strained against the spell, but it was blood magic. The only way to outmuscle a blood magic spell is to kill the caster. Who are you? I asked. Ryan gestured to himself. You don't recognize me? I'm Ryan, your roommate, he said. No, you're a demon, I growled. Well, yeah, he said with a smile. Which one are you? Ryan looked at his father, then back at me. Well, you see, once King Eberon got news of three of our own going missing during our little operation, he started to question what Malak was actually up to. So he sent me to take over, give the operation a little boost, if you will. After all, they are using my knives. Chernobok? I thought you were a rogue god. I was. Kind of. Until a squad of lightbenders killed my original form. I strained some more. Calm down, boy. It'll all be over soon. Fuck you. I growled. He shrugged. We're not going to kill you. We couldn't if we tried. We're going to escort you to the king. That was when I heard something from the hallway. Ryan heard it too. He looked up at the door. And then at Bella, who was standing over Reyes's corpse now. Mac had stood up, his eyes black. They were also watching the door. That was when I heard what sounded like. Singing. Singing in a familiar voice. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many men's soul and faith. I groaned under my breath when I realized who it was. Of course, that's the song he chose. My father stood in the doorway to the room, his good hand in the pocket of the prison jumpsuit. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. I was pretty sure he skipped a few lyrics, but I didn't care. L Lucifer? Asked Ryan. Ding ding ding. Now, which one of you asshats put the blood magic spell up? I watched as Ryan nervously looked at Armada. Lucifer smirked then raised his rotten hand. Armada was yanked through the air straight toward Lucifer, who caught him by his head and squashed it in a welter of blood and brain. 
I was suddenly free to move around. I shot to my feet and raised a hand, unleashing a volley of black flame onto Trail. Grace dropped to the ground. I turned back toward Ryan. Bella charged Lucifer with the dagger. Lucifer didn't even try to dodge the thrust. It simply didn't penetrate. He smiled down at her. You're young, aren't you? He asked before punching a fist through her chest. Elmo attacked next, trying to take a swing, but Lucifer moved in a blur, grabbing him by his throat and slamming him down onto the ground. Elmo's body exploded from the force of the impact, drenching the room in even more blood. I was focused on Ryan, who had fallen back behind Mac and Reyes. They tried to jump on me, but I burned them. Then, the teen stepped in front of me. She tried to grab me, but I clapped both hands on her ears. Her head was turned into a fine red mist. Akasi Malik had made moves on the others, killing one with a quick neck snap. The room was covered in blood and burnt body parts when we were done. I looked at Lucifer, who was standing over the crying April. He squatted in front of her and touched her forehead. She passed out. How did you escape? I demanded. He raised a brow at me. Really, Owen? No, thank you? I sighed. Thank you, father. Now, how did you escape? I could see him take a deep breath. Kiddo, I broke that warding like the day after they locked me up. My king, Malak said as he fell to his knees before Lucifer. Lucifer smirked at him. Then me. I brought your vessel here for you. I prepared the beginnings of an army for you. You can take this world before Abaddon. Then you can take back our home. This caught me off guard. What did he just say? Asked Grace as she walked up behind Lucifer. Lucifer turned and tapped her on the head. She crumpled to the ground. That was when I realized there was screaming coming from my comlink. Owen, do you copy? A fucking Lazarus canister just went off. Angie's voice called out. I could see the surprise on my father's face. Although I wasn't sure if it was a bad surprise or good surprise. He caressed Malik's face. My own contorted in rage as I summoned the twilight blade. I pulled it from seemingly nowhere. The blade ignited with black fire as I brought it down on my father. He caught the sword by the blade, then used the telekinesis-like power to levitate me. I roared at him. There's that hatred, he said with a smile. Who do you think this sword belongs to? You? No, it was mine. Malak stood pulling one of Chernobog's daggers from a pile of Bella's ashes. My king, use this. Transfer your essence into his body. Lucifer took the knife with his free hand, the rotting hand. He looked at the blade for a moment. I told you that you had a purpose, to fulfill my vengeance as my vessel. He sighed, almost a sad sigh. My king? Malak asked. But, Father Time says your destiny lies elsewhere, Lucifer said as he suddenly turned and sliced Malik in half. Malik gave them a confused glance, before his torso hit the ground with a wet squelch. I dropped to the ground, still giving my father an angry glare. He turned to me and smiled. That was when Trent Grayson walked through the door with Angie and Ophelia in tow. Lucifer looked at him and smiled. Trent came to a stop and raised his sword. Lucifer reached into a pocket, pulled something out, and tossed it at him. Trent caught it with his free hand. Here you go, Ant. I've been saving this for you. I looked at the object. It was a fucking cosmic brownie. Trent didn't say a word as he stared at my father from under the helmet of his armor. Lucifer smiled as he tossed the sword down at my feet, and then vanished. That was when Grace suddenly came to. We gotta go, Angie said. I could hear crawlers screeching from outside the room. We can't let the infected escape the building, he said. I picked up the twilight blade, and it ignited. That voice inside me calling for blood and gore. I looked at the rest of the team. 
Get as many people out of here as you can. I have an idea. What are you going to do? Asked Grace. Burn this fucking place down. Trent called for Aisha and Megan on our comms link. Both of these people had teleportation abilities. They'd arrive and we split up to find survivors. I made my way back to the gym alone, cutting down the crawlers left and right. For those of you who don't know what a crawler is, a crawler is what happens when you infect a living person with the Lazarus 1 pathogen. It causes mutations, extending the arms, legs, and spine of an individual so they have a predatory-like posture. Some of them also grow spines and bone claws. Their mouths unhinge like that of a snake's, and they grow jagged teeth. They also ooze green and yellow pus from their eyes and mouth. They're dangerous, but not really a threat to someone like me, who had nigh indestructible skin. Carving and burning a path through them was easy. I eventually found the Lazarus canister. It was in the middle of the dance floor, which was covered in smeared blood and body parts. The plan was to get the survivors out, which Trent and the rest of the team were working on, while I created a spell Megan had shown me, one that involved creating a fiery tornado. Only, mine would be full of black flame that burned hotter than the sun. I started to move my hands, to begin casting, but something hit me from behind hard. I stumbled forward. That was when I felt the teeth shatter on the back of my neck. The creature was on top of me, clawing and biting. Then, it wasn't. I was suddenly being doused in warm, syrupy liquid. I rolled, looking at the creature as it had been suspended in the air after being impaled by my tail. I started to get to my feet. As I did so, I noticed someone else. It was a man clad in black armor that was eerily similar to the nemesis suit. I gritted my teeth. He had circular red eyes that glared at me. I knew who I was staring at. It was Stapleton. He had a broadsword in one hand, its blade glowing a neon purplish color. You and your friends have been a major pain in my ass, he snarled. I'd find out what happened when Ophelia and Trent had intercepted him earlier through security footage. Stapleton hadn't been wearing his suit then. He'd been heading to the biolab and had been rounding a corner when his hand shot to his throat. He pulled a dart from it and stared at it for a moment in confusion. He then turned back to where Artemis had been, only to find her gone. He tried to take a step back in the direction he had come, but he lost his footing. He'd been hit with a trank dart. Now, he was awake and angry as hell. He stormed towards me with his sword in hand. I lifted my sword to be ready for an assault. He charged, but he made it two steps before he was suddenly tackled to the ground. He and Trent tumbled for a minute, before separating, the both of them getting to their feet. Stapleton leveled his blade, while Trent readied his own. So you're Abel's little project. Stapleton spat with venom. Owen, get the spell started, Trent replied. Stapleton brought his sword down hard, but Trent parried and sent a well-timed kick to Stapleton's ribs. Stapleton stumbled, but recovered. He'll only leave you and your loved ones to die when he's through with you, Stapleton barked in Trent's direction. Nemesis was having none of it. He went on the offensive. Stapleton was a good swordsman, but Nemesis had a ferocity to him now. He'd had it since he had recovered from the wounds inflicted by Dagon. He fought with an urgency. Stapleton kept up for a good few seconds, but it was clear that he was at a disadvantage. I started the spell again, my black swirling fire tornado rising higher and higher. 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, on and on it rose. The world around me melted. Nemesis and Stapleton continued their battle as the molten rock from the school's ceiling rained around them. Their suits were impervious to the flame. I lost track of them when Nemesis tackled Stapleton through a wall. I could hear the voices on comms. I think that's all the survivors, Ophelia said. Good. Owen, melt this fucking place. Trent, are you still in there? I'm keeping Stapleton busy. I'll be fine. Go. I unleashed my power like I'd never done before. Things became hazy once the flame spread to more of the school. News reports would say that the school was burnt so thoroughly 
that the support beams had melted. There were people who genuinely believed a nuke went off. All I know is that at some point, I passed out from the strain of those flames. I woke up a few hours later to the sound of a helicopter landing nearby. I could see Megan kneeling over me. She had a serious look in her eyes. I sat up. Grace and Angie were sitting close by, as were Aisha and Chad. The full moon bathed the tarmac in light. I couldn't see Trent or Ophelia anywhere. Megan seemed to notice this. Where are? I asked. She went into the building after him. Are they dead? I asked. Megan shook her head. No, but they are in GSF custody. I'd find out later that we had been blamed for the bombing of the school. That almost every government in the world aside from Atlantis now wanted our head. The ISDD was now a terrorist organization. Trent and Ophelia were in separate maximum security prisons run by Gideon. Their son would stay on base with Trent's brother and sister, both of whom had been taken to the island once the Secretary of Defense had been shot. I wasn't sure how they'd been caught. I knew we had to get them back. My mother and Angie were also permanently moved to the base. My mother had been expecting it for some time. I practically lived there anyway. The news framed it like we killed and ate babies. They ran hit pieces on every single known affiliate. All of our allies in the government were forced to either disavow us or were taken in for questioning. How much of that information the public believed? I didn't know. But I do know one thing. As far as this war with Aberon went, we were losing. But it wasn't over. <laughs>